I was saying I'm, I'm quite thankful that everyone quieted down pretty much all by themselves. Uh, so I think we'll go ahead and start the recording now. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anshul Guha, and I am the speaker's director of the William F. Buckley Junior Program at Yale. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this afternoon's debate on whether the United States should ban the popular social media app, TikTok. Before we begin the debate, I would like to say a few words about the Buckley Program and then introduce our guests. The William F. Buckley Program at Yale is the flagship program of the Buckley Institute, an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We have hosted lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, an annual and an annual conference since 2011. Our over 550 Buckley Fellows have a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully in serious conservative thought, the Buckley program has become an institution on Yale's campus and a symbol for a more open and representative political atmosphere. Especially at a university, where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and about how to become a fellow on our website at buckleyinstitute.com. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our guests and today's discussion. Claire Morell will be arguing in favor of banning TikTok. She is a policy analyst at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, where she works on EPPC's Technology and Human Flourishing Project. Prior to joining EPPC, Ms. Morell worked both in the White House Counsel's Office and in the Department of Justice, as well as in the private and nonprofit sectors. At the Department of Justice, Ms. Morell worked as an advisor to Attorney General Bill Barr. Prior to her role with the Office of the Attorney General, Ms. Morell worked on judicial nominations to the White House Counsel's Office and monitored all nominations data to create high-level presentations for briefing White House leadership. Elizabeth Nolan Brown will be arguing against banning TikTok. She is a senior editor at Reason and the main author of Reason's morning newsletter, The Reason Roundup. She is also co-founder of the libertarian feminist group, Feminists for Liberty, and a professional affiliate of the journalism program at the University of Cincinnati. Brown has covered a broad range of political topics since starting at Reason in 2014 with special emphasis on the politics, policy, and legal issues surrounding sex, speech, tech, justice, reproductive freedom, and women's rights. Our debate today will begin with each of our guests' five-minute opening statements, followed by each of their two-minute rebuttals. We will now transition into our opening statements, beginning with Ms. Morell. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here on Yale's campus. In my brief opening, I want to make the case for why the US government should ban TikTok for the sake of America's national security, particularly for the sake of the security and freedom of the next generation of Americans. TikTok is a tool of the hostile foreign power communist China that is being used to surveil and manipulate Americans and harm America's children. First, the CCP is using TikTok to spy on and surveil Americans. China is an actively hostile power to the United States, and TikTok is owned by a Chinese company, ByteDance. The company is literally headquartered in mainland China, and the ties between ByteDance and the CCP are deep. More than 300 employees at TikTok and ByteDance previously worked for Chinese state media. 23 of ByteDance's directors previously worked for CCP propaganda outlets, and at least 15 work for them now. Furthermore, Chinese law requires businesses in China to operate and build their cybersecurity networks in such a way that the CCP has unfettered access to their data. The CCP has access to TikTok's US user data by default. They don't even need to ask for it. And there is a lot of data for them to access. TikTok aggressively harvests user data, constantly collecting a wide range from names, contacts, networks, GPS locations, to even keystrokes and outside-the-app monitoring like internet browsing. 
To boil down what all this means, TikTok knows what other websites you go to. It's also tracking the keystrokes when you're on those sites. They can essentially know the username and password to your bank account. They don't need to read your encrypted messages when they can piece together the content from the keystrokes. The end result is that the CCP is acquiring massive amounts of data on a third of our population. This is giving them unbelievably detailed and extremely valuable pattern of life knowledge on Americans. China has deep, deep insights into how a third of our country thinks, how they operate, and what they're economically engaged in. And so China knows just how to influence that group. Second, from the sheer breadth and depth of data that TikTok collects, there is no doubt that the CCP will use this data to manipulate Americans and shape what we think. The CCP is already using TikTok and its algorithms to politically influence the United States, to spread videos that support CCP-friendly politicians or agendas, and to exacerbate divisions in American society. And they can and are doing so subtly. TikTok was used by China to push divisive content during the 2022 midterm elections, Forbes found. Many videos attacked specific U.S. politicians and pushed divisive social issues without clear labels disclosing they were coming from Chinese state-controlled media accounts. TikTok has also pushed pro-CCP content to U.S. users. Employees of TikTok's top buzz US, U.S. news app were instructed to place specific pieces of pro-China messaging in the app and pin it to the top. And the Washington Post found that there are only 20 videos available with the hashtag Tiananmen Square on TikTok, most of which say that the massacre never happened. Make no mistake, the CCP is using TikTok to shape what Americans believe is the truth, and that is frightening. TikTok does not exist so that we can be entertained by cat videos. Its purpose for existing is to capture and move audiences. That is its business model. Being owned by a Chinese company means TikTok is seeking to move our population in directions against America's own interests and toward China's. Third, TikTok is a particular national security threat to the next generation. The app essentially is a form of psychological warfare against America's children with aggressive algorithms sending our kids down rabbit holes of sexual drug-related and eating disorder content, destroying the minds of America's rising generation of citizens. We are in a reverse opium war. The Chinese know they are exporting the digital fentanyl version of this app to America's children. They want to turn our children into dopamine robots. Meanwhile, the Chinese version is like the spinach version of the app. It's extremely protective of children, promoting educational content and limiting children's use to 40 minutes per day with overnight scrolling banned. The utter disparity in the two versions speaks for itself that the Chinese are knowingly and intentionally exporting digital fentanyl in order to addict our youngest citizens without even having to set foot on our soil. Now I acknowledge that banning TikTok will infringe on certain freedoms, but we accept the government's infringements on lesser freedoms all the time for the sake of securing greater, more fundamental freedoms. This is the contract we made to form our government in the first place. The preamble to the Constitution states, to provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. A ban on TikTok is necessary to secure freedom for Americans from the surveillance and nefarious manipulation of the CCP. Imagine if the U.S. government was using a U.S. social media app to spy on and surveil Americans, manipulate and shape what they believe is true. Would we not be in an uproar at this extreme invasion of America's, Americans' privacy and civil liberties? Then why should we tolerate from China what we would never accept from the U.S. government? Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm going to start by just noting that TikTok actually has a lot of benefits. We don't talk about those very often, but it's an outlet for creative expression. It's an outlet for information and community, especially for um, young people who might have a hard time finding such community in real life. It's a boon for small businesses and independent entrepreneurs to find customers and reach out to people directly. It employs thousands of people in the United States. And it's good for competition with U US tech companies, which we're always you know, worried about having a monopoly on things. Um, but even if TikTok weren't beneficial, or even if the, net, um, the negatives outweighed the positives, that's not a reason to ban it. 
there are a lot of technologies and entertainment options that aren't necessarily good for us or good for society, and we allow those to exist because we are a liberal democratic society. And in such a society, we value things like freedom of speech, freedom of expression, free markets, and ideals, even if not every one of those ideals is socially beneficial. Saying we must ban something just because authorities don't think it's socially valuable is what authoritarian countries do, which makes it especially rich that we are talking about banning this in order to avoid being like, because we're afraid of communist China's authoritarian ways. Becoming like communist China in order to counter it seems a bit counterproductive. We have a constitution and governmental checks and balances that don't just allow lawmakers or executives to ban anything that they want to. So any attempt to ban TikTok must grapple with the constitutional implications or else it's nothing but political performance. And yet that's exactly what we have happening with a lot of the people who are talking about banning TikTok. Since US authorities can't say we don't like something or we don't like where it came from, so let's just ban it, we see people scrambling to come up with these other justifications, including national security, data privacy, and protection of children. But the case for each of these threats is inflated, and I want to just briefly start by going into that. Uh, youth protection. This is, I think, the least convincing case. At a recent House hearing grilling TikTok CEO, every single thing, every single youth problem that they attributed to TikTok was not a TikTok problem, but a social media problem. They were talking about trends and challenges and problems that were existing on all of the social networks out there, including all of those based in the United States. There's absolutely no evidence that TikTok or its algorithms are especially pernicious to minors. And in fact, TikTok has at least tr shown that it's trying to mitigate risks by putting these new sort of controls on there for how much time you know, users can use and nudging them not to use so much if they're under 18 and things like that. If you're gonna ban TikTok on youth protection grounds, you're also making the case for banning Instagram, Discord, Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitch, YouTube, and all other platforms for user-generated content. I said the youth protection argument was the least convincing, but honestly, I think the national security argument is just as bad. It is a classic moral panic. There is a lot of hand waving about China and communists and data, but no one has been able to articulate a coherent theory of how TikTok, a private company with multinational ownership, including a lot of US based owners uh, and data storage in the United States, poses a national security threat. Defense contractors are not sharing videos of themselves dancing in front of like weapons blueprints. And if they were, the Chinese government wouldn't need any special access in order to see that. The content of TikTok then is not really what people talk about when they're talking about national security. Some people suggest it's a threat because it wastes American young Americans' time and makes them stupid or allows tech executives who could be beholden to a foreign power to spread divisive or pro-communist content. Clearly. We don't need TikTok in order to waste time on social media. You can see that young people are wasting time on social media and on stupid videos across all sorts of platforms. This is not, again, not at all a thing that is unique to TikTok. Content on TikTok is actually often against China's preferred narratives about things as well. It's a place where a number of Chinese dissidents have gained a following criticizing the communist regime. That's why TikTok is banned in China, because we are allowed to show stuff that they are not. Their version of the app, Doyen, um, is actually, you know, it, it bans all sorts of speech that is critical of the Chinese government. TikTok does not. You can find all sorts of videos on there that are critical about myriad aspects of China. Even if it was true, however, that TikTok was pr pushing certain messages, and there's no evidence that this is, one, people are not passive zombies, just absorbing mindlessly any propaganda that is put out there for them. Two, Americans do just fine being divided on their own um, and, and believing insane and divisive things as, as again, we can see, um, it's not like TikTok is unique in this regard. In fact, you know, some might say it's a more positive place than many social media networks out there like Twitter. Um, third, foreign agitators can easily spread things on other apps too. Just look at the whole hoopla around Russian interference in the 2016 election and, and so forth. And lastly, it's not illegal to spread pro-communist info. The First Amendment protects this whether we like it or not. We counter this sort of speech with more speech, not by banning it. That's the American way. The most common argument about TikTok being a security threat is tied to concerns about user data, so I just want to touch on that briefly too. First, there's no evidence that TikTok actually is turning over data to the Chinese authorities. A ton of journalists with a lot of inside sources, many of whom are actually very critical of TikTok and have reported many negative things, will admit that they've been trying to prove that they've been giving this data to China and they have not been able to. No one has been able to actually show that. Let's just say as a hypothetical though that they are. By what mechanism does this become a security threat? 
For what possible purpose would China want the kind of data TikTok collects, which, despite a lot of fear mongering about this, is actually no different than the data that is being collected by every US social media company and so many different apps that we use on our phones. So even if Chinese authorities had this data on random Americans, how would that possibly harm national security interests? TikTok can't prove a negative, so a lot of people aren't satisfied when it says it's not doing this, even though no one has been able to find evidence of it, and even though it's jumping through hoops to safeguard US data by storing it here, sharing their code with a third party, all sorts of things like that. Still, we can't prove that this tech company isn't doing nefarious things with our data. So this might be a case for caution, but not an outright ban. What do I mean by caution? Specific users may want to limit or avoid the app entirely. If you are a high-level national security person, if you are an investigative journalist, if you are a dissident from China who is criticizing the government, maybe you shouldn't be using TikTok, just in case, out of an abundance of caution. Or um, you know, if you, perhaps you if you have a government device, you shouldn't be using TikTok or any social media on your government device. People who feel especially worried about data privacy and aren't convinced TikTok is safe, they don't need to use it. Problem solved without banning it for everyone else. The bottom line is that TikTok isn't perfect. We can point to myriad examples of missteps. But let's address those problems as they exist, not this tech panic, China hawk fever dream that folks have cooked up. TikTok has had the same sort of issues that a lot of US tech companies have had. But TikTok has also proved more than willing to work with US regulators on solutions that will um, quell fears about US data being safeguarded and its code being on the up and up. Let's let them do this and see how it goes. If there are specific proven violations of US criminal law, of administrative law, of um, corporate procedures, then the DOJ or the FTC or private actors in civil courts can go after those problems specifically. But invoking national security isn't a trump card to ignore the Constitution and other constraints on government power. Ultimately, there are ways to address people's concerns with TikTok without resorting to the tactics of the Chinese Communist Party. If we do, it could have bad consequences for US companies and, ironically, for national security as well. If we do this, other countries might start banning our tech companies or demanding local storage of our data from our tech companies, which is bad not just for US tech companies, but for our ability to reach folks abroad and for a global free internet. A free internet, international communication, and global trade actually help prevent international conflict. Banning TikTok also doesn't stop with TikTok. There's this act called the Restrict Act, bill called the Restrict Act that's before Congress right now, and it would go forth and ban all sorts of um, apps or communications tools in any country that the United States declared a hostile foreign actor. So, you know, it could start this whole war where suddenly countries around the world are banning US tech companies, and that could have very negative implications for us too. Um, Ms. Morrell, now for your rebuttal. I just want to briefly offer a couple points of rebuttal. The first I would say is that this is, it's not authoritarian. I don't think it's fair to say that the United States banning this app is akin to acting like an authoritarian regime. In fact, I think it is precisely because we do not want our country to be infiltrated by an authoritarian regime that TikTok should be banned. And so the question is, is, it more, is there more freedom with TikTok or without it? And that's what I'm trying to argue, that we are actually more free from authoritarianism by banning TikTok and not allowing the Chinese access to the way Americans think in order to manipulate us. And so that is the first thing I will say, and this is not using the tactics of the CCP, it's using constitutional executive authority, using IEPA, and there is precedent for this. In 2019, other Chinese telecom companies like Huawei, ZTE and Chinese telecom were banned for similar nefarious reasons. So there is precedent. The second thing, it is constitutional. I realize that that is something that people debate, but I would argue that it is constitutional for several reasons. The first of which is that the bills and things proposed to ban TikTok are not actually going after speech. They're not banning speech. They're banning the ability of TikTok to be able to do business in the United States. Secondly, this is a Chinese company. They are not subject to the protections of the First Amendment. And third, if there is the, the, the consequence of certain Americans having more restrictions, per se, on their expression, I know is, is something that you argued, there's also precedent for examining those consequences, which is, is there a significant government interest in restricting these means of expression? And if so, are there alternative venues for that expression? And in the case 
of TikTok, the answer to both is yes. There is compelling government interest for national security reasons. And two, it, uh, there are plenty of other social media apps. It is not just TikTok. There are other avenues. I will also just say I am not making the case for banning all social media. I don't think that that is what we're talking about here. The issue is really who owns this company and that is that it's a Chinese company. And I think you mentioned that there's not evidence that China is actively accessing this data. I think that a lot of people use this kind of as a red herring. The thing is that China doesn't actually need to ask, ask TikTok for access to the US user data. In order to do business in China, you have to set up your cybersecurity networks in such a way that there is a back door. There is always access for the CCP to it. So there is, it's not an issue of if there are instances or evidences of them actually making those requests. They don't need to request it. And lastly, I will just say I don't think it can be left to individual consumers. I, I don't think that they actually truly understand the harms. I don't think the national security harms are inflated. I think that China is playing a very, very long-term game. It is not so much the content and the data they're collecting and how harmful that could be immediately. It's the fact that they are coming to understand how Americans think, act, what we're economically engaged in, getting access to intellectual property. And it's not just your data, it's they're getting access to your network, your contacts. So if you have a relative who's working in a security sector or in a business where China is interested in that intellectual property, that's at stake. And so I think we have to recognize they're playing a very, very long-term game. Even if we can't see immediate harms, they are trying to manipulate and shape our country in ways contrary to our interests. And so I would just argue that for all these reasons, it is important that we ban TikTok. Excellent. And now, Ms. Brown, for your rebuttal. Yeah. So I just want to make clear that Byte Byte Dance is TikTok is TikTok's parent company. It is actually uh, headquartered. It is actually incorporated in the Cayman Islands. It is not incorporated in China. TikTok is a U.S. is a subsidiary of Byte Dance, and Doyen is the Chinese subsidiary. So I think there's a lot of times people confuse this, but Doyen is actually the Chinese app that is based in China. ByteDance is not strictly a Chinese company. It is owned by part venture, capitals and, uh, venture capitalists and people all over the world, including America has, um, um, some American investors have a very large stock in it. And TikTok, the, the subsidiary of ByteDance, is based in, has um, headquarters in the United States. And also, it is doing a lot, it's been already doing a lot to separate US user data, and it is prepared to do a lot more to separate US user data. So I don't think we need to accept the idea that even if, in the past, the Chinese government has had access to this data, which again, no one has actually proved. But even if they do, that that is necessarily going to be a problem going forward if this US user data is stored on US servers and they're giving Oracle, a US company, access to their code so they can make sure that there are no back doors, nothing fishy going on, and things like that. Um, while it is true, so if you know, ByteDance is a Cayman Islands company, it is true that ByteDance does not have First Amendment rights. But Americans have First Amendment rights, and Americans are users of tip TikTok. So the fact that this country, that this app was started in a foreign country or incorporated in a foreign country, does not get around all First Amendment implications. Um, and then, lastly, I just want to say, you know, the inter um, she mentioned the International Emergency Powers Act, which is what a lot of people say that should be used in order to ban TikTok. There's actually a big problem with that, and that is that specifically there are exceptions to that. Which, so the, the act lets the president ban, ban you know, these foreign sort of um, things based foreign companies or products based on you know, um, extenuating circumstances, but there's an exception for information and informational tools. So that has been in place since the 1980s. That is actually why a federal court struck down when um, Trump tried to do an executive order banning TikTok. So it isn't strictly true that it would be totally fine under the International Emergency Powers Act for the president to ban TikTok. It would still run into a lot of issues. And even there's not really a good feasible way to do that either. So you know, using that act, they could say, OK, so US app stores cannot sell, cannot make TikTok available. OK. But then TikTok could just host a place to download its app on a server outside the United States, and people could still go there and download it. Also, plenty of people already have, millions of people already have it downloaded on their phone. That would do nothing to stop those people from using the app. The app. 
You could ban TikTok from doing financial transactions with Americans. But again, that wouldn't stop people from posting videos or watching videos on the app themselves. So the actual like technical feasibility and the, the um, constitutional feasibility of anything that we can do comes far short of a, of a ban on TikTok. And this is, again, why people, when they, when they talk about you know, banning TikTok, they just sort of throw that out there without really considering um, you know, how exactly it would work on both a legal level and on a practical level. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now go on to the Q&A section. For each question, both speakers can give their own answers. And I'll start with a few of mine, and then I'll start passing the, the mic out to the audience for audience questions. All right, so my first question has to do with, um, and Ms. Morell actually alluded to this in her rebuttal, uh, it has to do uh, with partisan activity. So TikTok is a forum that has spawned many social movements, some on the right, some on the left. Uh, I can just give one example. Uh, some young adults recently used the app to protest the Biden administration's decision to green light the Willow oil drilling project. In light of this, could banning TikTok be seen as a partisan activity that hinders political organizing? And if so, what are the First Amendment of First Amendment implications of banning TikTok, and does this change the calculus of whether or not we should go forward with it? Does it matter who answers first? It, it's up to you. Do you want to? Um, I can start. I no. So I don't think that it would qualify as a partisan move to. Or, or like you were saying, interfering with political or partisan activity. I think, again, I started to state this up front, but the issue isn't how the app works or the issues with social media that Ms. Brown pointed to. It's that it's owned by a Chinese company. And so this really is in the lane of national security. And for that reason, I think that the United States government can say this hostile power to us is actually trying to use this app to politically influence us. So I understand there may be, I know Ms. Brown alluded to benefits, there may be some benefits of politically organizing on this app, but there are other means available. And again, this is what I was talking about, the kind of constitutional test. There is a significant government interest for restricting uh, this method of speech. And again, I, I have more to say on the different bills that have been uh, put forward. Some are better than others. I would agree with Ms. Brown that the Restrict Act is not a good bill, but there are other bills like Senator Rubio's, and it just goes after the economic conduct of the ability of TikTok to do business in the United States. And so it's not a restriction on speech or political activity, and therefore I do not think it runs into the First Amendment. And even if it did, it would count as a significant government interest. And then the second thing is there are many other avenues available for people to politically organize. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. It is not exclusive to TikTok, and so in that regard, it would also pass that test. And Ms. Brown? Um, so just to say, you know, just because speech isn't, isn't political, I'm just to go, I was just saying, just because speech isn't political or, you know, particularly informative or anything, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have First Amendment protection. Like, even the stupid, you know, cat videos or dance videos or whatever on, on TikTok have First Amendment protection. Um, as to whether or not it would be, it would be, you know, seen as partisan, I mean, I think that there is a wide variety of activity. There are people on the far right, on the far left, there are moderates, there are people, every, you know, everything in between that are, that are putting videos on TikTok, so I don't think I don't think there'd be a very good case for saying that a ban on TikTok would necessarily hurt one um, demographic or the other, although you know, young people do tend to vote um, Democrat more often, and TikTok is a spot for, for young people. So I guess Democrats could have a case for saying that you know, Republicans want to ban it because they're trying to stop you know, the spread of Democratic ideals, um, Democrat party ideals. But Democrats are just as into banning it as, you know, as Republicans are right now. But I, I, I'm glad you brought that up anyways, though, just because I think it, it does, you know, bring up an important factor, which is that there is a lot of important communication that does happen on TikTok. Young people love this app. Young people are not going on Facebook anymore. Um, you know, they are using this app to have important conversations about everything from mental health to politics to, you know, just to, to, to anything that is affecting them in their lives. And this is an important avenue for them to find information, to reach out to one another, to feel like there is a community. Um, and. Uh, you know, just because they have other outlets to do that, again, that, that doesn't matter. You can say, you know, well, you, you, can't, you can have a protest in a whole lot of places, so you can't have a protest here. That still doesn't mean that banning the protest wouldn't be against the First Amendment. You can say, like, well, you can read a lot of newspapers, so if we ban this one, 
it's okay, you can always read another newspaper. That still doesn't get around the First Amendment. Just because people would have other outlets for finding this information if TikTok didn't exist, doesn't mean that TikTok and its creators and its viewers do not have a First Amendment right to view that content and to create that content. Thank you to both of you. For my next question, uh, I'd like to focus on an argument that Ms. Brown actually made a few days ago about how uh, one reason why TikTok might not be banned is that it's simply too popular amongst young adults and amongst advertisers. So Ms. Brown, if tic is TikTok really too embedded into American society to ban. I mean, you know, one argument against it could be that it's only a few years old and maybe it hasn't permeated so much yet, yada, yada, yada. Another, uh, and, and for Ms. Morell, uh, another question could be if TikTok is really so popular amongst young adults, would banning it alienate these young adults and possibly cause them to fall even further into depression? Yeah, so, you know, obviously whether or not it's popular does not way on whether or not we should ban it or not, you know. Um, but I do think it's interesting. I, w I was writing about, yeah, some arguments people were making with how popular it's become amongst US advertisers. And actually, like, a lot of them have um, started a lot of lobbying campaigns. So I think what it speaks to is, is not necessarily whether or not we should ban it, but how difficult it actually would be. Um, like, a lot of major US corporations have invested a lot of money in like partnership deals and in advertising contracts with TikTok. There's also a ton of people, creators, that make money off of TikTok. They were organizing and lobbying on Capitol Hill. And there actually are a lot of um, Democratic uh, members of Congress and politicians who have been using it a lot to get their message out to young voters. So I think there's a significant contingent of both corporate interests and political interests that, for self-interested reasons, do not want to ban this app. And that will, thankfully, actually prove a, um, a serious hindrance to, to any legislation or any orders to actually ban it. Um, yes, I would just say I, I do not think that uh, banning TikTok would further isolate youth. I actually think it would help them to re-engage with reality. But again, as Ms. Brown stated, that that's not the real reason for the ban because, as, as she rightly said, a lot of the issues affecting social or affecting children is more broadly attributable beyond TikTok to social media, and and so it's not that's not the motivation for banning it and. Likewise, it shouldn't be a hindrance for banning it, its popularity among, among teens. We have to really just continue to go back to the fact it is a Chinese company, and they are trying to access us, access our data, understand Americans and how they think. I mean, this is just a, it's, they have basically a third of our population access to it because it's so widely popular. It's their dream come true that it became so like spreading like wildfire. And I'll, I'll make the analogy again that I did at the beginning where if the U.S. government was doing what Chinese, this ByteDance Chinese company is doing in the United States, if the, if the U.S. government was accessing all this information from a U.S. social media app, we would say this was a huge incursion on American civil liberties and privacy. And so I think that is, again, the motivation behind banning it. It's not whether or not it's popular. It's not even really about the harms to children, though, as I mentioned, I do think that is an intention of the Chinese government to allow the version that is imported to the United States to be so detrimental to children. But it's really because of their purposes behind it and what they are going to then use that data for in the long term. And so I think that that justifies banning it. Well, thank you to both Ms. Morell and Ms. Brown. Um, I'd just like to ask one more quick question before I turn it over to audience Q&A. Uh, and this question is, applies more generally to all social media. So do you believe, as Senator Josh Hawley and presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy have suggested that we should ban social media for all users under the age of 16? Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, again, I, I know I keep coming back to this. I'm a big First Amendment person. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but uh, you know, even, even teenagers have First Amendment rights, for one thing. But another thing, it is an important part. Like Again, this is an important way that teenagers find information about politics, about mental health, about um, LGBTQ activism, about things in their, maybe that they're not able to talk about with people in their real lives or in their communities. So it is an important part of teenagers' lives, and we shouldn't just deprive them of access to that just because 
there might also be some scary parts of it. Which is not to say that they should view everything or that they should be you know, using social media in an unlimited capacity or without any restraints, but that's the role of parents and families and schools and others to get involved in. You know? like, there is a, a spot for personal responsibility here. And I, it's weird, I think, that that's become sort of like a, a taboo to argue in this context, that parents should dare to you know, put some controls on their own, their own children's social media use. But again, like, we should not be catering the internet to protect the most, you know, the youngest users because the internet is for everyone and that should be up to, you know, technology companies provided the tools. They have provided the tools for parents to put filters on things. There are all sorts of different ways to go about this. So I think that that has to be a matter for, for individuals and families to deal with, not for to set a policy at the national level. There is an undeniable link between the rise in mental health issues among teens and tweens today, skyrocketing rates of anxiety, depression, suicide, even self-harm that is linked to the widespread use of social media and the adoption of smartphones that have become ubiquitous among teens and tweens. And so I will say that Senator Hawley's and Vivek Ramaswamy's proposals I think would actually make a big difference in the lives of teenagers. And although they may be uh, seen as almost too extreme, I think that is the kind of point we have reached in where our current rising generation, uh, the threats really to their, to their adulthood and to their mental health and well-being. I will say that's not the point of our debate today, but I will just respond briefly to what Ms. Brown was saying about it being an individual choice. It really, it really isn't, an, parents really aren't enough. Um, when it comes to social media. I've talked to parent after parent who's on the front lines of these, of these challenges, and even if they do all the work to keep their child off social media, their child still experiences the effects that social media has changed the entire social dynamic that their child operates in. And so Jonathan Haidt, a professor at NYU, has, term, has used the term a network effect. Social media, the effects on teens is not necessarily through individual users. It can affect the entire, it affects the entire social dynamic. And these network effects, parents are really powerless against. And that is why I think it merits the government taking a serious look at social media and what it's doing to our teens and trying to better pass policies that will empower parents and protect children. And so, but I do think that I don't want to go down too much that sideline in that today we're specifically talking about the uh, app TikTok, and again, the reasons for banning it completely is due to the Chinese ownership of the company. Thank you very much to both of you. Now, uh, please raise your hand if you have a question for our two guest speakers. Thank you. Um, hi, I am Genevieve. I am actually an undergrad. Uh, here at Yale, I left an 18-year career in national security and intelligence. Um, and I apologize, because this is going to sound bad, but having spent 18 years working in that sector, I am curious if you feel qualified to actually truly speak about whether or not this is a national security issue. Because the nature of warfare and the future of warfare is changing at an astronomical rate. And we are all still trying to understand it as it morphs and evolves and changes. And I'm curious, I, I have no other issue with anything else that you said and your debates were spot on in a lot of cases. I think the freedom of expression issue is, um, and freedom of speech issue is definitely one worth having. But I agree with her in this sense that we cannot ignore, because we cannot see or because the general public cannot understand the capacity and the dangers and the threats, does not mean that we should ignore when people who do say that there is one. So I will just say that I, I am not just going on my own like impression of this. There are a lot of national security out experts out there with a lot of experience in the field. and. They have also argued that this is not a national security threat. So this is not just my opinion alone that I, that I am sharing. Um, also, you, know, you, you kind of said that there might be threats that we don't know about. Then it is on experts and politicians 
to prove those threats. The burden of proof, if you were going to ban something that has such, such huge economic consequences, um, civil liberties consequences, and perhaps you know global relations consequences, the, e the proof should be on the people who actually are alleging a national security threat. So far, we just get a lot of people being like, well, there could be. You know, They could do this, and they could do this, and they could do this. If there is a threat then, if there really is a threat, I think they need to prove it, not just make vague allegations that you know data, China, things like that. I'll just respond briefly and say that I think there are a lot of experts actually on the other side, though, who are, are saying that this is a serious threat to consider. And again, two things I stated early on, the fact that there is a long-term game that China has to this. I mean, it's, we're giving them amazing access to a third of our country to all that data, and some of it is encrypted. And they don't even care that they can't decrypt it right now. They just want it. And it's because the more data that they get, the more that they can understand how Americans think to be able to subtly influence and shape and manipulate this country against our own interests and towards China's. They are very clear that they are hostile to the United States. And in fact, even just recently, the Wall Street Journal published the fact that China is very opposed to a forced sale or ban of the app in the United States. And it's like, how, how much more obvious could it be? Why do they care? It's because they're, they're going to lose then access to all of this information that they're collecting on us without us even being aware of it. And so I, I would just reiterate, it is a national security concern. I don't think it's too inflated. And I think that, um, that as you mentioned, just there's a lot of concern about we, we may not understand everything that they're doing. And in, in some um, cases, it might even be too dangerous for security experts to explicitly state what purposes they're using it for. And so there's a lot of things in the national security community that are not explicitly shared with the United States, but they can vouch for the fact that there is nefarious um, reasons to be concerned. And so, um, yeah, I would just, I would just reiterate these, my initial These point. are just potential reasons. Like, you keep saying that you know that they have this data that we know they have all this data and we don't no one has been able to show that so many people who have deep sources inside TikTok and have been deep investigations into this have been looking i know you said well we, they might have it and we don't even know and again i that's true but there is no proof and there is no evidence that that china has, chinese government has this data that is that is even asked for this data well, there was a report that BuzzFeed News put out in July of 2022 this past year that showed that there was over 80 internal conversations where it became clear that the Chinese government had accessed TikTok US user data. And back to something you said earlier about how they're now trying to really protect US user data and keep it in the United States using Oracle, this whole Project Texas, I'm sure you've heard about. The people working on that project have repeatedly been frustrated, the consultants, that they're having a lot of difficulty closing the backdoor loopholes to the Chinese to the Chinese company and then the Chinese being able to access it. And so there's actually, there is reporting showing that the Chinese have access to TikTok user data, that it is very difficult to lock down these channels back to ByteDance where the Chinese can actually access it. And so there, there are news articles and good reporting that has tried to make the case and show evidence of China actually accessing US user data. Uh, Ms. Brown, I, I kind of want to poke at your your First Amendment argument. You said earlier that that civil liberties are, are what's at stake here. And, and what I want to ask is, if the U.S. government right now were to ban TikTok, how are my individual civil liberties to speak what I want to say being violated in any way whatsoever? And, and also, I, I understand the, the hesitation to want to ban companies, but I think there's a very distinct difference in wanting to ban, say, an American company operating in the American free market and wanting to ban a company that does not operate in a free market. Chinese companies are, are legally beholden to the CCP by, by state law, and so I, I wonder if you can maybe kind of explain how you reconcile that difference in, in using free market principles to want to, to protect ByteDance and, and other Chinese companies. I mean, we protect U.S rights even if you know we are allowed to see information that originated in other countries we're allowed to see it if it comes from apps or tech companies in other companies if it comes from media outlets if it comes from publishers books we don't say that we can't see this stuff like i mean by by your argument there we'd be saying well all of this stuff if it originated in another country and if we don't like their principles then we shouldn't be able to see it that is what china does 
China blocks its citizens from seeing information from foreign countries that it doesn't want them to see. That is the difference. We don't do that. Uh, it might not affect your ability to speak or read if, um, things if you don't use TikTok. But there are millions of Americans that do use TikTok. And this would infringe on their rights to speak and to hear speech. And that is, that is the fundamental part of the First Amendment. Um, I'm a little bit confused about, about how it's even a question, how it, how it would implicate the First Amendment, because that is what the First Amendment protects, the right of American to both speak freely and to hear the speech of others freely. And it would violate very many people's rights, even if, you know, if your particular rights aren't being implicated, or even if there are other outlets. Again, like throughout the history of American First Amendment law, it doesn't matter if there's another avenue for something. And that's a, that's a slippery slope to all sorts of things, like I mentioned earlier, saying like, well, why can't we just ban this newspaper because you know there are other newspapers? Why can't we just ban this website because there are other websites? No, that's not the way that it works. I'll just say, though, I think we accept restrictions on, on our civil liberties at different times for the sake of national security. As I stated in the preamble, that was the point, is that we accept certain restrictions on freedoms for the purpose of a greater fundamental freedom, which is our national security. And I think we have to recognize that banning is not restricting civil liberties, permitting it is, because the Chinese Communist Party is intruding on our privacy and our civil liberties by using, by having this app be so ubiquitous that they can access this data on us. I mean, you, do you want the CCP to know your bank account and your password or your private messages? I think we really have to consider the other side of the civil liberties argument. Hi. Um, it seems like a core clash in this debate is whether, like, to what degree there is actual data collection going on. Um, if you both step aside from your evidence for a minute and are willing to consider um, data collection as like simply a possibility, right? Like it's possible that the Chinese government is collecting the data. Then, uh, Ms. Morrell, would you say that that is enough to ban it? And Ms. Brown, would you say that um, that is, um, yeah, would you, would you also operate based off just that threshold of uncertainty? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, I kind of tried to allude to that in my opening statements. Um, no, I don't think that that would. Even if we, if, even if we had evidence that they were turning over this data to to the um, to the Chinese government, I don't think that makes it a national security threat. I don't think that there's, you know, that they actually have that they can do very much with this data. It's not much more than you can get from. Um, data scraping from publicly available sources right now anyways. It's not more data than US tech companies collect. There's no real benefit to why, like why would the Chinese government want, you know, to know like what videos Americans are watching. They can find out what people are sharing and watching anyways just by going to other social media, by using publicly available networks. So I don't think that, that even, if, even if they did have that data, I don't think that that would be enough of a reason to ban it, I don't think that would make it a national security threat, and I don't think that would be enough to limit the idea that people could consent to to be a part of it, even if they do that. You know, like we give our app, like people download all sorts of shady apps, and they give their data to who knows what. You know, like it's amazing. And actually, there's a lot of evidence. Sorry, there's a little little tiny tangent, but um, of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice and all sorts of federal agents that buy this data from social media companies as a way to get around Fourth Amendment protections, as a way to get around having to get a warrant. So like the US government is buying all this data from tech companies too. I just don't think that that's necessarily um, a reason why people shouldn't be able to use these apps. Um, it's a good question. I will just say first, it's hard to kind of disentangle data collection from the fact it's a social media app because that is how social media apps function. And TikTok in particular is very aggressive in the amounts and kinds of data it harvests, which is kind of what kind of makes it uniquely pernicious. So I'm like really trying to like disentangle and set aside the data collection concerns um, because the apps like have to collect data. And I think the question is then, if it's a Chinese company, who has access to that data? Putting that aside, I think we, we would have to still be seriously concerned the fact that it's a Chinese 
owned company and an app being used by a third of our country. And what exactly is the content on this app that's being then circulated and fed to our children that's now occupying so much of their time and their brain space? I think we would still need to be very concerned. Is this not just Chinese propaganda? I mean, like if you look back at you know, just the history of our country, I think we've been very wary to allow hostile foreign powers to actively export their propaganda to us. And so um, even setting data collection aside, I think the fact it's a Chinese-owned company that's trying to reach a third of our country with an extremely addictive app that keeps people on it for very amount, long amounts of time. And for some of the evidence I cited earlier of Chinese state media accounts by you know, using their apps to promote this propaganda without labels or anything helping someone to understand it's actually Chinese state media. This isn't just some neutral account point, uh, promoting pro-China, pro-CCP politicians and content. We would still need to seriously be concerned and, and consider a ban. Yes, I would say that. Uh, thank you so much um, for, for being here. I found it uh, very, very interesting. I, I wanted to push back, though, a little bit on the analogy that, that uh, you know, between banning TikTok and banning sort of an individual newspaper uh, as an argument for the First Amendment issue. Um, I'm not a legal scholar or a tech, tech expert, obviously, um, but as I understand it, I, you know, the reason why these social media companies have been able to avoid liability for content that is posted on their sites is that they sort of are treated as US law, under US law sort of as news stands and aggregators of news sources rather than producers of news themselves. Um, and, and while I agree with you that the thought of, you know, closing down a newspaper solely for the reason that there are other newspapers is kind of concerning, um, you know, the thought of, the thought of closing down a, a particular newsstand um, because it's it's you know causing some sort of danger um, for the reason that there are other newsstands that people can access the same information, albeit maybe with a little bit more effort, seems to me to be a little bit more of a reasonable argument that that might not deny this or might might not sort of infringe on people's First Amendment rights as much. So I'd like to get your reaction to that, and and you know if you think the bar the bar might be a little bit different than the you know newspaper analogy that you proposed. Sure, um, we can take the newsstand. Uh, analysis, uh, analogy, and I think that, that the First Amendment argument still applies, because you said, you know, well, we could shut down the newsstand if it was engaged in harmful or, or you know, behavior. Um, I think that depends on what you mean by, by harmful. If we found out that it was guilty of the crime, if the company or the owner was guilty of a crime, and they proved that in criminal court, then, then yes, there would be reasons to shut it down. If it was just like, we don't like what they're selling, we don't like it. We think that they're only selling pro-Chinese propaganda magazines or pro-Russia propaganda magazines, or we don't. We think that maybe you know they're getting some of their they're getting some of their books from China or from Cuba or from other places, and not telling us that those books actually came from there. That still would not be a, a legal reason, a constitutional reason, to shut down that newsstand. So I think it you know if we want to use that analogy, it still could apply to TikTok because it's like. Okay, if TikTok is guilty of a particular crime, then let's go after them with criminal law. If they're guilty of breaking a particular administrative rule or something that would, you know, fall under the FTC's purview or the FCC's purview, then let's go after them for that. You know, like they've gone after American tech companies for all sorts of things. So, um, but if it's just, you know, we're worried that maybe the information there might be harmful or might come from people who we don't know it is, then I think then it, you know, it, like the newsstand, it would still not be, you might not like it, but it would still have First Amendment protection. But yeah, thank you, that's a good question. Hi, thank you both for coming. Uh, my question is for Ms. Morell. So uh, should the United States also ban any other apps that are owned by uh, Chinese companies or whose parent companies are owned by Chinese companies? Um, for example, uh, perhaps you're familiar with the gay dating app Grinder, is uh, owned by a majority share by a Chinese company. I mean, if we ban TikTok, where does this go in regards to other apps or uh, other things that aren't apps? So it's a great question. I this is kind of a segue, I guess, into talking about uh, one of the bills I had mentioned earlier. So for that reason, I think. We, yes, we should be concerned about other Chinese-owned apps. That's kind of the whole kind of my argument really is about the fact that it's owned by a Chinese company. And 
I will say I publicly, you know, supported Senator Rubio's bill, the Anti-Social CCP Act, and, you know, his bill does say TikTok qualifies, but it also lists several other countries of concern, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and that social media companies from these countries um, could also rise to a level of concern that would merit banning their ability to do business in the United States. And so again, I think it's really important to focus on the fact these bills are going after their economic conduct in the United States. It's not saying that app can't go do business somewhere else, but it's just that we're concerned for our own national security and it can't do business here. And so yes, absolutely, that's why I really liked Senator Rubio's bill is because TikTok is, is the fight that we're having now, but what's down the road? What else is China coming up with? I mean, there's other Chinese apps like WeChat that we should also be concerned with. And so I do think that there are other Chinese apps. I can't speak to the particular national security threats, as I think you mentioned, Grinder that I know of, but the point is that yes, we should be examining these apps that are owned by Chinese companies and seeing if they rise to the level of qualifying as an area of national concern, security concern, um, given it, the amount of data, what kinds of data they're collecting, what they're accessing, and, and again, the other part as well, or what propaganda are they importing to the United States on us? I think we have time for one more question and then closing remarks. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Morell and Ms. Brown. I have a kind of follow-up questions uh, based on the previous one. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, Google, YouTube, Twitter, not, probably not Twitter, uh, were all very popular in mainland China. And quickly, they're, um, they're all banned. And would you say that the US government banning TikTok would make the US government to, down to the same level as the Chinese Communist Party? And then I have a follow-up question that uh, we're seeing, uh, I read somewhere last week that the top five apps out of the top seven app in the app stores are made by a Chinese founder. And we're seeing a lot of Chinese companies in the, in the, in the global stage. Are we entering a world where a global free market is discouraged and we're seeing two camps of Western American apps dominating this side and Chinese app led by Chinese founder dominating the other side with very little overlap and collaboration and competition in between? Um. <laughs> yeah, I hope not. I hope that we're not seeing that. Um, and I think that that very much is the danger here. Um, I, I agree with your your question that um, you know if we if we are banning TikTok or if we are banning all Chinese companies or all company um, you know companies that originated in a country that we think might be hostile for some reason or not you know um, conducive to democratic ideals or things like that, then then yes, we are being no better than the Chinese you know communist government and. It does worry me that this would start a slippery slope of, of you know, banning any app that originated in China, banning any app that originated in countries of concern, which can be like, you know, as I mentioned, the Restrict Act, it gives the, the Treasury Secretary, or the, um, sec it gives someone, I forget who. Commerce. Like, Commerce, yes. Commerce Secretary, I was like, Treasury's not right. No, it's okay. <laughs> uh, power to de determine, you know, on, a, on an ongoing basis, what countries would fall under this category. So yeah, I think it gives us just way too much leeway for, for people to ban things. And then there will be reciprocation, not just from China, but from all over. Like right now, we sort of set the standard where, yes, there's a lot of free flowing exchange of ideas, of businesses um, on the internet. And I think that this really could, you know, get us down this path where, where like you said, like there are siphoning off uh, or, or siloing off of different, you know, th these these countries go with these apps, these countries go with these apps, and that would be very unfortunate. Um, right now, you know, like there's a lot of apps that are like popular, like a social media app that's popular in Russia, and it's not popular here, but you can get it here. I was doing research for a story, and I downloaded it, and I was able to chat with a lot of people in Russia. I've downloaded um, WeChat before when I was working on stories about Chinese massage parlor workers, and I needed to see advertisements that they were posting and do that. So banning these apps would, you know, not only be bad for people who, who use them for communication and entertainment, but also for, for research purposes and for reporters who are trying to get a, get a hold of what's going on on the global scale. I just think there, yeah, there are so many reasons why it would be bad if we are breaking everyone off into, okay, you can have apps from your country you can have, or from these Western countries, but not these other countries and things like that. I'll just briefly say, I don't think it's authoritarian to put your national interests first. And so that's what I'm arguing for, that it, we are trying to prioritize our national security. I don't think that inherently makes it an authoritarian 
thing. I don't think you can equate the U.S. saying this is in our national security interest to ban this app to authoritarian CCP. In fact, as I said earlier, I think the United States is trying to protect our country from the infiltration of an authoritarian regime over our citizens. And so I, I, I don't think that our guiding principle and decisions is what will be best for global business. It's what is most important to America's interests, our national security. As I said, the preamble of the Constitution, this is one of the primary purposes of our government, to provide for the common defense. And so I would just say that that is why it is not an authoritarian um, action for the U.S. to say that this app is dangerous to our country and our freedoms. Well, thank you to all of the audience for your insightful questions, and thank you even more to our guests for uh, their lovely conversation. Uh, we'll now move on to the concluding statements, and since we started with Ms. Morell for the opening statements, we'll start with Ms. Brown for the concluding statements. Okay. Um, gosh, all right. <laughs> I, was like, I, mean, I don't know anything about this. So many yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I, you know, I just, I think you can't, you can't, you know, protect civil liberties by infringing on them, which is essentially what Claire has been saying. You know, um, there, I, I think that's a sort of it's just a very weird framing to, to say that, you know, because of national security, because they might be doing propaganda, we're protecting our civil liberties by keeping those ideas out. The American way is not to censor, is not to keep ideas out that we don't like, is not to try and say, oh, this influence might be bad, we are just going to ban it. It is to counter that with more speech. It is, allow, it is to, you know, allow pluralism and allow ideas to be countered with more ideas and not to fight it by just banning it. I do think that, you know, you can, you, no matter how you phrase it, that is getting us into the, to the same thing that authoritarian governments do. Free governments do not prevent their people from using apps just because they originate in a foreign company, in a foreign country, just because there might be some sort of uh, security threat that hasn't been proven. If there is a national security threat, I think that we need to see a lot more evidence of that. We need to make a much stronger case from that. And so far, no one has actually done that. They have just sort of made implications about China and implications about what could happen. Um, as it stands, there's just there's just not enough evidence to ban it on a social um, on a national security reason, and risking r banning it risks so many things, um, as as we've talked about here. But mostly, it it risks making America not what America what make I was gonna say not making America great, uh, but it <laughs> risks making America like getting rid of the American values that we want to protect. We are saying we want to protect these American values from Chinese influence. We cannot do that by becoming more like China. Thank you. And then we'll move on to Ms. Morell's concluding statement. Uh, yes, I will just say the, again, banning TikTok is not, it's not an intrusion on our civil liberties as much as it is trying to prevent an intrusion on our civil liberties by the CCP. So I just, I feel like, I know you said that that's not a correct framing. I want to push back and say that, again, this is an issue where we know that the owner of this social media company is a Chinese company. And as I said at the beginning, there are very close ties between ByteDance and the CCP. And so it is, I think, a protection of our civil liberties for the United States to say that we do not want the CCP intruding on Americans' privacy and security. And so it's actually, I, I think I'm also pro defending our civil liberties, but we shouldn't only be concerned about the US government infringing on our civil liberties, but how much more so a hostile government to the United States having this access to our privacy and this threat to our security. And so I don't want to be pitched as an anti-civil liberties uh, person. I'm pro our, I'm for the Bill of Rights and all the protections that it provides for us as Americans. And that is what I want to defend. I want our country to have that strength of our democracy, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. We're trying to defend these against the incursions of the Chinese Communist Party. And so I would just leave you with the question of, are Americans more free with TikTok or without it? And as I've argued for the reasons of their surveillance, their manipulation, their psychological warfare against our children, that Americans will be more free from authoritarianism. Our civil liberties will be more protected if the United States steps up 
and takes on the role of the role it was designed to do, which is to protect its citizens first and foremost. This is the purpose of our government. And so I do think that now is the time for the U.S. government to act um, on behalf of, the, of its citizens um, to protect their civil liberties. And we will be more secured if TikTok is banned. Again, thank you to both of our uh, lovely guests and also to all of the audience members who showed up and asked some really great questions today. Uh, we'll be moving on now to the dinner portion. And um, if, you're, if you're coming on the dinner, then uh, please meet over there near the exit sign. And otherwise, I hope we see you in a future Buckley event. Thank you. Thank you.